my colleague from the NFL Media Group, one of our favorites back here on the show, Ian Rappaport. How are you, Ian? What's going on, Rich? How are you? Well, lots is going on, brother. Let's jump into it. I know you're a busy man. We all uh, we all have so much to to hit here. It was one of the craziest weeks ever. Um, it started with the Rams shocking us with uh, Von Miller and then ended supposedly with the Rams shocking us with Odell Beckham and then that crazy game broke out last night. Let's start with Odell. Uh, how did he wind up on the Rams, Ian? Well, you know, he had at least five offers. Uh, I think more, but at least five that we know of. Um, no, actually, it would be six. It would include the Rams. So at least six offers. And, you know, I think they were all pretty similar. A couple were around the minimum. Packers were minimum. Chiefs were minimum. New Orleans was a little more. Seattle's was a little more. The Patriots was a little more. And the Rams was kind of in the ballpark. But they were, like, kind of a stealth team. And, you know, because they didn't really – like, there was a report that he was narrowing down to three teams and the Rams weren't one of them. And, um, you know, I I think what, what happened from his side, from Odell's side, is he basically told the Rams, like, let's keep talking. Like, I know the money's not crazy, but let's keep talking. Um, Because at the beginning of this, he identified the Packers and Rams as his top two teams. He knew there'd be some interest from the Packers. I don't think he knew there'd be any interest from the Rams. So he kind of prodded them on a little bit. And then they started talking, and then Von Miller got involved, and then Jalen Ramsey got involved, and uh, it was a whole big recruiting thing. And in the end, it was down to the Packers and Rams, and um, I think he, you know, I think he ends up making a good choice that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think so uh, too. Um, you know, and I got to have Trent Dilfer later on to talk about how the X's and O's might or might not work out. So it's amazing, you know, he and Von are tight. So. Vaughn, uh, the acquisition on Monday, he doesn't play on Sunday, but already pays dividends to get Odell be- there on the following Thursday, essentially. Yeah. That's what you're saying. And I don't, you know, we'll see on um, what happens with Vaughn. I'm not even sure he's playing this week, you know, because I think the Rams have a bye. Yep. Rams have a bye next week, right? Yes, they do. Yeah. So I think there's definitely, uh, we'll see what happens, but there was definitely some talk of, waiting till after the bye to make sure Vaughn's ankle is fully and 100% healed. So we'll see what ends up happening. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, he's a he's a big-time star power guy. Odell's a big-time star power guy. They're in a city where, you know, that really works. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious about the actual football part of it because, you know, the Rams, were, Rams have some pretty good receivers. Um, and I think they would be fine with Cup and Jefferson and Robert Woods and, did they need Odell? Probably not. Um, but it's not a bad, you know, third or fourth receiver to throw out there, right? But the Chiefs were in on him, huh? And 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 I guess yep. that that's you know the Rams certainly um, say getting him and preventing him from going to Green Bay or New Orleans. Those are the teams that you'd mentioned. Seattle as well in your division. So you're preventing him from going somewhere in your division, and then other places in your conference, and then eventually potentially to a team that I know is is not looking super right now, but the last two AFC Super Bowl combatants in the Chiefs, that's that's a plus two, yeah. you know? So um Yeah, assuming that he's gonna be you know, assuming that he's gonna be a net positive, right? Like the money it's sort of like who cares, right? I mean, you know, the reason you save money against the cap is same thing as the Carolina Panthers. Like the reason you save money this time of year is to be able to spend it like this and it's not like you're gonna spend it on much else. Right. Right. So um, the money's sort of whatever. You just have to hope Odell is a net positive. I know in Cleveland he was not, um, and that's not like a shot at all. It's literally just a fact. Like they are a better team when he's not on the field. You hope it is the opposite with the Rams. Ian Rappaport here on the Rich Eisen Show. How did Cam wind up with Carolina? Ian, give me the yeah. storyline there. So a lot of hard conversations, um, and one specific. So you know they knew probably Tuesday that Sam Darnold's injury was pretty bad. Um, now, it's funny because, like, well, it's not funny, but it's interesting because Darnold looked really bad. And I think we all, the public, decided that he just sucked. Huh. But reality was he was pretty badly injured. And I'm not sure how many people actually knew that. Not a lot of people. Um, and he, you know, just couldn't make, couldn't make, like, regular throws. And you realize that it's hard to make regular throws with a cracked shoulder, um, mm. which is interesting. I learned that this week. Um, <laughs> And so they found out how bad Darnold's injury was. And it was like, do we stick with PJ Walker, who we like, or should we just should we just do it? Like, 
Let's just see if Cam is interested. So Matt Rule called Cam up on Tuesday night and was like, are you interested? And he said, yeah, I'm interested. So they got in the room. David Tepper, Stephen Drummond, well, their VP of football operations, Scott Fitter, Cam Newton, his dad, and talked it through, talked about the way everyone left, talked about the sort of divorce, realized that they were better together than apart, and they got together. And it was I mean, it really is a little bit surreal. And he's on the practice field as we speak, and I still can't believe it. Yeah, I know. I saw him arriving number one in Carolina. He must be yep. – it must be weird for him, too. He thought he'd never do this again, and then football can be a, a, a crazy thing. Um, did the Saints never think about Cam, reach out to him a, at all? Because you'd have to wonder if Odell would have gone home to them if if it wasn't, you know, a second-slash-third-string quarterback that's going to be starting – for them the rest yeah. of the year. I mean, I, I don't, I, I didn't know that the Saints, I don't know that the Saints reached out to Cam, but I do know that uh, there were quarterback questions from Odell on the Saints. Like, I think he, I mean, he really liked the Saints. He really liked Sean Payton, just like he really liked Bill Belichick. He talked to Bill Belichick personally a couple of times. Um, it was just the quarterback. It's just Trevor Simeon, you know? And I, not that my, Football X's and O's means very much. You know, that's not what I do. Um, I think Trevor Simeon will be good enough to lead the Saints where they want to go. He does exactly what Sean Payton wants to do, and that is valuable. He just follows his directions, which is definitely something. But if you're a, you know, potentially superstar receiver, that's not what you want. Um, so I think that was why the Saints kind of didn't end up with Odell. So Cam spoke to Bill, huh, personally? couple of conversations no, Odell Odell yeah. uh, right sorry Pardon. Odell spoke yeah. to Bill personally yeah. a couple times yep. oh okay this is amazing I mean uh, unbelievable a mid-season free agency tour for Odell Beckham Jr. is just the latest I mean, twist and turn you know you know it was, it was weird I have to say too because you know like these fr free agency is crazy you know March is absolutely bananas right um and I just like personally I was not totally ready for like the toll that this would take, like the last two weeks feel like they've been two months, <laughs> you know, like yeah, Odell man. finally signed and it was a craziness yesterday. And I was fine. I was like, all right, man, like let's just have a normal week once, you know? I know. I, as I said that the Vaughn um, surprise acquisition by the Rams and then the Odell surprise signing by the, the Rams in the, in between is the, the wildest NFL yada, yada, yada of all time. You know, it's kind of crazy, man, what the yada, yada, yada was. And in terms of that, Ian Rappaport, what can you tell me about Aaron Rodgers? Um, you know, what do you think? He'll be cleared Saturday and play Sunday and that's it? It'll be as simple as that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he should be cleared. And, you know, the more we go through these circumstances, the more we learn about them. Mm-hmm. Um, he really doesn't have to do very much of anything. Like, he does not need a negative test tomorrow. He's gone through 10 days. Right. What Dr. Alan Sills told Judy Batista yesterday is when players have COVID, sometimes they test positive anyway. Right. Even if they are no longer able to transmit. Even if they're no longer contagious, they still test positive. So he doesn't need a negative test. He basically just needs to be cleared by a doctor and – not have symptoms. So, I mean, he should be cleared and should be able to go on Sunday. And and any word as to his physical well-being? I mean, this this uh, does he again? I I I know he's a a, a, <laughs> a reigning MVP and in in rock solid shape. And I'm a 52 year old father of three. But it took me a while to actually get my sea legs on anything like without not feeling ex exhausted at six o'clock at night and people can obviously yeah. have different feelings. He, he, he'll be able to play a national football league game at a high level against the Seattle Seahawks coming off a bye and, and off we go. Best you can tell. I, I believe Rogers. so. Okay. Um, but I will say this, like there's been a couple examples this year. Chandler Jones was one, you know, Chandler Jones had a, I would say a fairly significant bout with COVID was eligible. This was early in the season was eligible to come off the COVID list on a Saturday. Mm-hmm didn't come off the list and everybody was like, why he's able to like, what's the deal? But the reason he didn't was because he wasn't ready. Like he just didn't feel well. Like he, he no longer had COVID, but he just felt crappy. Right. So he didn't play, he played the next week. I think Rogers should be good. Sounds like his symptoms are very minimal. 
but you're right. Like I would say the same thing with the Browns. Like, you know, they have uh, they have Nick Chubb on the COVID list this week. Like theoretically, he could be cleared by Sunday. I'm not sure he plays just because he hasn't practiced all week. It's so difficult. It really is. What about Kyler Murray and uh, DeAndre Hopkins and the the Arizona Cardinals? Could we see Colt McCoy for a second straight week? What do you think here? Uh, Kyler is on the practice field now. That's good. So the fact that he's practicing is at least a sign that he's got a real shot. We'll see what happens. Like, I assume he'll be a game-time decision again. Um, but practicing is better than not practicing, so he's got a shot. DeAndre Hopkins, no. No practice again. So, you know, I would say he probably doesn't have a great shot. Okay. Um, now, uh, a couple last things for you, Ian Rappaport, before I send you off into your Friday. What was with Tua not starting last night? And then he gets in, and then it, it's just weird, man. The whole quarterback handling of this team is so weird from kicking the tires on Deshaun Watson two weeks before a playing season, then getting the rare owner player on another team – a permission to speak prior to a trade deadline doesn't happen. They put the genie back in the bottle, I guess, but Tua doesn't start and then comes out and wins. Is he the guy moving? Like, what the hell is going on there? It's just the general sense of the question. Um, Ian. So here's my sense. Brian Flores had two options on Thursday. He had a not fully healthy Tua or he had a fully healthy Jacoby Brissett. Now, sometimes – not fully healthy quarterbacks are better than anyone, literally anyone. They did not believe that was the case. So Jacoby Brissett starts, looks not very good, honestly, um, and tweaks his knee and goes down riding in pain. Now, the fact that he was able to come back and get cleared is okay, but it did not mean he was 100%. So then your options for Flores are, are a not 100% Jacoby Brissett or a not 100% Tua. And he chose a not 100% Tua after watching the offense struggle mightily with Brissett, who, you know, was not very good. Was, was not very good. So his choice was Tua. And what resulted was some wobbly throws and some kind of not great moments, but also some good moments. You know, like there were some, some leadership moments from Tua there. There were some big-time – Big time plays, despite an injury, despite a fractured finger, and all that. Like, in the end, it really, really worked out uh, for Brian Flores and for the Miami Dolphins. But the plan is still let's let's get Deshaun Watson in the fold in in March, right? I mean, how can you say that's not after you try to do it in in November? Correct. Well, depending I on mean, depending on if things are, are are clear enough and he's a viable citizen slash football player. Correct. Right, but that's that's a big. That's a big depending if, right? Because if Stephen Ross, you know, my understanding was Sean Watson was not traded because his cases were not settled. Well, how much more clarity are we going to have by February, March? Like, are we really going to have that much more clarity? And if Stephen Ross wouldn't do it then, would he do it in March? Also, could be a lot more teams interested. I would expect. Carolina Panthers to be interested as well. I would think they're not going to be the only team. Probably going to be some other very interested teams. So I think the Dolphins will probably explore again, but I would have a, I would definitely have some questions. All right. That. Last one for you, Ian. Uh, the taunting rule and flag that uh, got called on Cassius Marsh on Monday Night Football. Perry Fuel, the SVP of officiating, folded into a 90-second video that was tweeted out from the uh, Twitter official account of the NFL officiating, says, yeah, good call. Why? What are you hearing? Do they really want that called? Do they really, or they're just backing up their official in their way and telling everybody else, don't do that again? What can you tell me on this? I mean, why? I mean, they've actually been really consistent. They've been pro-taunting, not pro-taunting, pro-taunting rules mm -hmm. or anti-taunting. Um, they have been every time they've had the chance to say, "Oh, that went you know over the line, whatever." They have not. They have said taunting is not good, and you should not do it. And if you do it, you'll be penalized. Now, for that one specifically, on one hand, like what did he really do? He just basically stood there and stared at the sideline. On the other hand, it was clear what his intent was. He was basically posing 
in front of the other team looking at their sideline. Now, if I was on the other team, would I be offended? No, I'd probably be more offended by his ridiculous karate kick celebration. Um, <laughs> but I understand it. I understand why that was taunting, and I understand why the NFL does not believe that has a place, and I understand why he was flagged. So there, there was no no debate, best you can tell? Like, there was, like, yeah, sure, let's have – Let's have a game totally potentially decided by something like that, and we're cool with it. and And fans are outraged, you know, and players same, are players think the that they're being put upon. Like, I mean, sorry, honestly, the, you know. No, I get it, but it's the same issue as, you know, oh, would you really want to call that penalty at this time? Like, oh, that's sort of passing, you know, that's past interference, but you know, let them play in the final two minutes. It's like, isn't a penalty just a penalty? No, I've heard that for right. all 18 years that I've been with NFL Network, Ian, and um, I've always had a problem with it. Do you it. believe it? Um, I, I do believe that, that that things should be a foul called no matter what, but then there are others in a gray area that if it's a gray area, just keep the keep the flag in your in your pocket. And then there was no conversation. To, what did they? What are you hearing about Carrenti? He didn't bump the guy. He didn't hip check him. Like that didn't happen? Well, what are you hearing about that one? Uh, in the NFL uh, offices. Not, they do not believe that there was a hip check. Okay. All right, Ian. So they do not believe there was anything intentional. Okay. All right. That's there. You know, that's a difference. There's a difference between that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like <laughs> parsing a difference. out the word. Oh, no, 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 no. That's, if he thinks it's not intentional, then that's, you know, honestly, you can lose your balance or something like that. I don't know. Ian, thanks for the I call. I bump into people all the time. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Take care of yourself. We'll chat on Sunday game day morning. Look forward right. to it as always. Look forward to it. Right. Take care. Look That's Ian Rappaport. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.